All right, maybe we can go ahead and get started. So welcome to the, the last uh, lecture of the semester. So here's the, the plan for, uh, for the day. Uh, so I'm going to mention some uh, topics, some technical topics that I haven't really covered or haven't done justice to. Uh, the next thing we'll do is uh, zoom out a, a little bit uh, and talk about some kind of big picture stuff, uh, so robotics and how it relates to the economy, uh, to ethics, and to laws. Uh, and then I'll briefly mention some kind of cutting edge uh, research challenges uh, that we're thinking about in, in our research group and, uh, and beyond. Uh, so these are the courses, uh, that the topics that we have covered in, in the course. So we started off with feedback control. Uh, so how do we uh, control our quadrotor to make it hover, for instance, so equations of motion, uh, feedback controllers, LQR, uh, and so on. Uh, we then talked about motion planning, so how can we get a robot to get from uh, point A to point B, or configuration A to configuration B without colliding with obstacles. Uh, we talked about discrete planning, both feasible and optimal, uh, and also planning in uh, continuous spaces. Uh, we then talked about state estimation, localization, and mapping, so Bayesian filtering. Uh, and its many kind of variants, its specific uh, instantiations, and also applications to localization and mapping. Uh, and finally, in the, the last module, we talked about computer vision, machine learning, uh, and a tiny bit of uh, reinforcement learning. Um, so I guess the, the goal for, for this course, from my perspective, was to uh, basically give you an introduction to uh, the fundamental theory and algorithms uh, for robotic systems with some hardware implementation to, to see where the theory and algorithms uh, kind of break down. Uh, and I tried to cover most uh, kind of relevant uh, topics, at least from my perspective, uh, without getting the, uh, the course, uh, without making the, the course too uh, survey-ish. Uh, and I guess as a result, to, to balance the, the breadth of topics and the, the depth uh, in topics, uh, there's a bunch of topics I didn't uh, either cover at all or didn't really do uh, justice to. Uh, so robotic manipulation, legged locomotion, uh, reinforcement learning, uh, human-robot interaction, and, and robot design. Uh, so I'll just spend a, a couple of slides uh, talking about each of these and then giving you pointers if you're interested uh, in exploring more uh, these specific topics. Uh, so in this course, we've mostly thought about objects in the world as things to be avoided. Um, so even the, the final project is kind of based around this premise that you want your drone to get from point A to point B. Um, without colliding with, with obstacles. Uh, but often, uh, objects are not things that are to be avoided, but rather they're things to be uh, manipulated. Um, and this is a, a kind of major uh, area of research, has been a major area of research in, in robotics for many decades, uh, and continues to be uh, today. So here's a video. One of the hardest things to do. Sorry, let me just uh, pause and play that again. Yeah, here's a video. Uh, so this is the Amazon uh, uh, picking challenge. This was from a, a few years ago uh, that explains some of the, the basic challenges behind manipulation uh, and some uh, specific approaches that teams were taking uh, to this challenge. Oops. Simple as it would seem, it turns out that one of the hardest things to do in the world of robotics is something any child takes for granted. Simply identify an object and pick it up. See how, how I can collapse the hand so I can get it into where it is? A robotic hand, just I haven't seen anything with that sort of dexterity. Ty Brady is chief technologist at Amazon Robotics, where they're trying to inspire some of the greatest minds in the industry. Ty looks at the human hand in ways you probably never thought of. We have 27 degrees of freedom that we call it. So a de de one degree of freedom is the ability to translate in one direction, right? So we have this little amazing knuckle here, here, and here, and there's so much going on there. Ty and his colleagues have come to Nagoya, Japan for a sort of robot Olympics. It's called the Amazon Robotics Challenge, where teams from around the world compete to come up with a robot that can identify objects on its own with its own cameras and processors, then pick them up and put them in a specific place. It is not easy. We probably fail more times than we succeed. Alberto Rodriguez leads a team from MIT and Princeton, a scrappy bunch up against some teams backed by major corporations. This is a hand, a robotic hand, a suction cup, two fingers, high fidelity tactile sensor. It's a book for which is gonna try a flash grasp. It's not going to work. Oh, wait, it might actually work. This is kind of a fancy move, though. There you go. Woo! Teams are competing for a quarter million dollars in prize money in front of a live audience. I won't play the, the rest of the, the video. So, yeah, that team was 
collaboration between uh, MIT, it's Alberto Rodriguez's uh, group, uh, and a team at uh, Princeton, so Tom Funkhauser uh, and his uh, PhD students were uh, leading that, uh, that effort. Um, here's another uh, video of robotic uh, manipulation. So this is a, a demonstration uh, of this kind of home robot or potential home robot uh, cleaning up a home. I guess very slowly, but still, still, still doing it, doing a, a pretty uh, good job. Uh, so it's identifying uh, different objects, um, picking them up, uh, and then uh, placing them in some kind of target uh, location. And again, this is a, a nice example of, of manipulation. So the robot has to figure out what can be manipulated, like what is sort of like trash in the in the in the home, uh, and not just like furniture. So it's not it should not try to like pick up uh, large pieces of furniture. It should pick up the, the things that are just like clutter. Uh, identify them, pick them up, and then place them in some uh, location. Uh, there's also uh, other kind of uh, uh, applications of manipulation that are uh, kind of potentially down the horizon. So this is in, in, uh, in warehouses. This is an example from uh, Boston Dynamics, uh, their handle uh, robot. Uh, it's a kind of interesting robot morphology. Uh, so they have these like vacuum uh, kind of suction uh, grippers, uh, and they use uh, them to, to do these kind of pallet uh, loading tasks. So they're picking up like pretty heavy objects, uh, manipulating them, uh, and placing them um, uh, to uh, fill up the, the pallet. Uh, and one final one, uh, this is a, a fun example uh, of another one of uh, Boston Dynamics' robot. I guess many of you have maybe seen this robot. Uh, so the person in the video is uh, Andy Barry. He's actually a former uh, lab mate of, of mine uh, at MIT. I guess he's no longer at, uh, at Boston Dynamics, but he worked on uh, the spot robot. Uh, in this video, he's being really mean to the robot. In real life, he's a, a really a nice guy, actually. He's not, he's not that mean. does eventually make it. All right, there you go. Um, yeah, and I guess there's, there's lots of potential applications, right, where uh, robotic manipulation can be really useful. Uh, it's already being use, used. Uh, so Amazon, in, in particular, I guess, has invested uh, lots of, uh, of funds uh, to automate uh, various parts of their um, uh, kind of uh, pipeline. Uh, and many of the, the techniques, the technical like topics that we've covered in, in this course uh, also directly apply to, to manipulation. Uh, so computer vision for detecting uh, what an object is, the, the pose, like the location and, and orientation of the object, uh, Bayes filtering, uh, particle filtering, for instance, for like, estimating the, the position and, and orientations of objects, uh, motion planning for getting your robot arm from some location to the, the kind of grasping uh, location. Uh, but there are also a, a number of techniques that are pretty specific to manipulation. Um, so figuring out where uh, on an object I should get the gripper, gripper to, to go and, and grasp. Uh, what is a, a good grasp? So there's a bunch of uh, kind of metrics for quantifying what a good grasp is. So intuitively, I guess I'm not going to uh, spill my coffee, but like something like this uh, is not necessarily a, a good grasp, but something like this is a good grasp. Um, and you can quantify this by thinking about uh, the robustness of a given grasp to forces and torques. Uh, so a grasp is good if there's a large set of forces and torques that you can uh, counteract. So at least that's one definition of a goodness of a grasp. There's lots and lots of other uh, definitions as well. Uh, I guess nowadays, uh, learning-based approaches, so approaches based on reinforcement learning in particular, are becoming pretty uh, popular uh, for doing uh, robotic manipulation. But there's still a, a fair bit of kind of planning uh, that is useful in, in manipulation uh, as well. So if you're interested in uh, reading more or learning more about uh, manipulation, there's a really nice uh, review article uh, by Matt Mason. Uh, so he's, uh, I guess, one of the, the pioneers in, in robotic manipulation and has done a, a lot of work over the last uh, three or four decades. So it's called Towards uh, Robotic Manipulation in the Annual Reviews of Control Robotics and uh, Autonomous Systems. So it's from 2018. Uh, I guess there's, there's obviously been progress since 2018, but I think this is a, a good uh, starting point if you're interested in, in uh, learning more about manipulation. Uh, there's also actually an entire course on uh, intelligent robotic manipulation at MIT, uh, and a, a bunch of their uh, course materials are available online. So if you want to really dig deep, 
uh, I think that could be a, a good uh, resource. I guess any questions on uh, manipulation? Okay, so another topic is, is legged locomotion. Uh, again, Boston Dynamics has a, a lot of uh, super impressive videos, so I guess many of you have probably seen uh, their Atlas uh, humanoid robot uh, doing all sorts of uh, really amazing things, uh, leaping over obstacles, running over rough terrain, uh, and at the end of the, the video doing a, a backflip. So I guess one argument for legged robots, which is not something we've, we've really explored in this course, we mostly used uh, the drone as our motivating example, uh, but one argument for, for using uh, legged robots in practice is that uh, legged robots are really versatile uh, in terms of the terrain uh, that they can handle. Um, so rough ground, stairs, and, and so on, uh, that are uh, sometimes hard for wheeled robots or even like tracked robots to, uh, to really kind of uh, navigate through. Uh, many of the, the techniques, again, that, that we've discussed in, in this course uh, are directly applicable to legged like robots. Uh, feedback control for, for balancing, uh, for instance, uh, or for controlling uh, like the, the legs of the robot uh, to track trajectories. Uh, motion planning to get some kind of high-level uh, plan for the, the robot to navigate through, through obstacles or even like doing some kind of lower-level planning as well for the legs. Uh, but again, legged like locomotion has some specific theory uh, and algorithms that we didn't really uh, have a chance to, to discuss. Uh, and again, legged like locomotion, I guess I'll, I'll show in a, in a couple of slides. Um, there's a, a kind of uh, infusion of uh, reinforcement learning and, and learning-based techniques uh, that are, uh, are, are pretty uh, exciting. But um, So this is a, a kind of nice review article of uh, more like model-based uh, techniques for uh, legged locomotion. So this is from 2016, uh, modeling and, and control of legged robots. So this article, I guess, takes the, the kind of perspective we've taken in this course uh, at the beginning, uh, which is writing down a dynamics model, uh, writing down some kind of optical, optimal control problem, uh, doing uh, feedback control, doing motion planning, and so on. Uh, and I'll mention some more uh, kind of recent work using learning-based techniques uh, to do uh, legged locomotion. All right, so RL, uh, we spent just one lecture uh, in the, the previous lecture talking about uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, the basic idea, again, just to, to remind you, uh, is that you have some robot, some agent, uh, that is operating in some environment, uh, and we don't necessarily know the, the dynamics of the environment, uh, or maybe we know them because we have a simulator, uh, but it's hard to kind of uh, take gradients, for instance, of the dynamics. Uh, so at each point in time, the robot gets some cost or a reward, uh, the state gets updated and the robot takes some control input to try to minimize costs or equivalently to maximize uh, rewards. Uh, here's some recent work on using reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning uh, for legged locomotion. So this is work from uh, Polkit uh, Agarwal's group and Sangwe Kim's group at MIT. So this is the MIT uh, mini cheetah quadruped robot. Uh, and I guess this was the, the highest speed linear and angular uh, that they obtained uh, for, for this robot. Uh, and this is showing kind of robustness to, to different uh, terrains, like slippery ice or, or uh, like rough uh, kind of patchy grass and so on. So I think in this video, if I'm not mistaken, the high level planning is not uh, automated. The, the thing that, is, uh, that the reinforcement learning is, is learning is the, uh, the kind of gate uh, and the, the lower level uh, yeah, control. The feedback control for like recovering from falls and, and other kinds of uh, failures and adapting to, to diverse uh, terrains. Uh, and this kind of work, I guess, uh, is pretty similar in spirit to, uh, to what we saw in the, the previous lecture with uh, uh, reinforcement learning. Um, so there's some reinforcement learning that's happening in a simulator uh, using lots and lots of uh, kind of parallel uh, simulations. Uh, and a bunch of the, the tricks uh, or implementation 
uh, kind of uh, details or strategies that we discussed in the, the previous lecture uh, are also useful for, uh, for this work. Uh, so things like domain randomization, where you randomize different uh, properties like friction and so on, uh, lots and lots of uh, simulation capabilities, uh, neural networks, uh, and some of the, the algorithmic uh, kind of techniques that we discussed in the, the previous uh, lecture. Uh, here's another, actually, even more recent work. So this is just from a, a couple of months ago, uh, where uh, this is from Deepak Patak and Jitin Ramalik's group, uh, where they were using reinforcement learning to do some of the high level, higher level uh, kind of control, so like footstep planning uh, for the legged robot question. Yeah. So in the previous video, yes. Yes. Yeah. If you can usually fit it into the robot itself, or do you need to connect it to the external device? Yeah, good question. So uh, I think this video actually, uh, or even this uh, frame, um, gives you some idea of the, the kind of uh, computation. So uh, this, I believe, is, this is a, a unitary uh, quadruped or a quadruped robot uh, built by unitary. Uh, so they've attached a little bit uh, of extra computational power. Uh, so the thing right in the, the front is a, a depth sensor. Uh, so that's not uh, computation. The robot itself has some depth sensing, but they, I guess they found uh, it useful to have a, a depth sensor kind of higher up uh, on the robot. Um, and they've attached some CPUs and, and GPUs to the, the robot. Uh, but I think with these additions, uh, like it's all the computation and sensing is, is on board. So this one is untethered. Um, so typically, the techniques that use deep reinforcement learning uh, require some uh, like GPU uh, to be on the on the robot, or I guess if you're uh, if you have a tether, then uh, on your kind of offboard uh, computational platform. Um, but but yeah, I guess nowadays, uh, like especially with with uh, like Nvidia's like smaller uh, GPUs, like the NX, for example, is a pretty powerful uh, GPU that you can put on these kinds of platforms. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, it's possible to, to do everything on board. Yeah. Good, other questions? Okay, yeah, let me just play this video again. Um, yeah, so there, on, on the top right uh, is the, the depth image uh, that, that you're getting, uh, that the robot is getting from the, uh, yeah, from its depth uh, camera, and you can see it's not perfect, right? If you look at, uh, yeah, if we just look at it again, um, it's mostly getting the, the, the kind of uh, uh, like stool like surface is correct, but uh, there's a bunch of gaps that, uh, that show up every now and then. Uh, so you have to be robust to, to those kinds of sensing uh, errors if you want to get this kind of uh, performance. Uh, and so I guess many of the tricks we discussed in the previous lecture where you simulate sensor noise, you simulate uh, changes in friction, changes in terrain, uh, all of those uh, kind of implementation uh, um, strategies are, are being used uh, to make this happen. Yeah, it's kind of interesting to see some of the um, emergent uh, behavior uh, where it like slips and it like catches itself and uh, it, like trips and I think in some of them it like falls uh, and it uh, gets back up again. Yeah, so it's able to, to handle a pretty uh, kind of diverse uh, set of, uh, of different terrains. All right, so question. Just like I noticed that the back legs are kind of facing the same way as the front legs. That's right, yeah. I'm wondering if that's like, when we think about like a human, for example, like our knees bend differently than our elbow, like it's opposite. Yeah. So do you know like why that might have been used or why they're all facing the same? Yeah, I think for stair climbing, uh, it is easier, I believe, to, to do it. Um, yeah, to have it uh, this way. So, um, yeah, I guess the, there's a, uh, yeah, if you look at one of the, the stair uh, videos, maybe the, the bottom left one, I think that gives you a sense for why this configuration uh, might be good. You can, yeah, you can like, I guess it's hard to do it with my legs because they don't bend that way, but uh, yeah, to, to like uh, make the leg go this way, so that gives you more clearance and then you can lift it up and then uh, put it up again. So I, I think that's the, the reason for, for this uh, particular kind of morphology. Yeah. Good question. Question? Is this, like, is it currently being trained or has already been trained? Yeah, so this is the, the final kind of output. So the, the training uh, was 
uh, in simulation. Uh, and yeah, so I guess similar to, to what we discussed in the, the last lecture. So they're just uh, like doing all the training and simulation uh, with a lot of different kind of diverse terrains. Uh, the one extra piece here is that they use the sensor uh, measurements that the robot is collecting to uh, estimate uh, different properties of the environment. So uh, they actually like estimate something that has to do with friction or like the terrain and so on. Uh, so there's a kind of like online like adaptation that, that happens that uh, that leads to additional uh, robustness. But all of that uh, training happens in sim, and then they deploy it uh, with the, the real hardware system. Yeah, in principle, you could keep fine tuning, right? So you could uh, like keep learning uh, on the on the actual like hardware system. So you get something that's like pretty good in sim, uh, and then you get something that's even better by like continuously uh, learning. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a good question. So uh, I guess a part, a lot of that comes from the fact that uh, the reinforcement learning algorithm is just trying to maximize some reward, right? Some uh, expected reward, and the reward function uh, is something that I guess someone like specified to be mostly reasonable. Uh, but it's hard to capture like all the like nuances of like human uh, motion in a kind of really simple uh, reward function. Um, I guess one stra potential strategy is to use imitation learning. Uh, so you try to get some reward that like mostly captures or, or like tries to capture the uh, yeah the behavior that uh, that you get from uh, humans or animals. Uh, I don't have a, a video I guess on the slides here, but uh, there's some work on. Uh, doing imitation learning from uh, like dogs or like other like quadrupedal animals, uh, and then basically transferring the the policies uh, that you learn from that imitation learning onto a, a robotic quadrupedal platform. And I think the motivation there was that uh, well, one I guess that you don't need to uh, do reinforcement learning at least in the beginning. You can get uh, a decent policy just via imitation learning, uh, and I think it could potentially lead to more like natural. Kinds of uh, of motion here. Yeah. yeah, so I mentioned uh, a few uh, resources on, on reinforcement learning in the, the previous lecture. Uh, so the textbook, that's a classic, uh, and, a, and a couple of other uh, resources as well. Uh, and I guess I'll, I'll just mention a, a couple more uh, uh, additions to that list. Um, so in this course, at the, at the beginning especially, we talked about optimal control and a lot of the notation and the terminology we used for, was from optimal control. Uh, there are like pretty close links between optimal control and reinforcement learning. Uh, you can kind of think of it as, as trying to solve the same problem, but with a slightly different like emphasis, uh, specifically on like what things are assumed to be known. Like, do we assume that the dynamics are known or not known? Um, and so, this book by Dmitry Bertsikas, it's relatively recent, I guess, from 2019, uh, does a really nice job of uh, providing a kind of unified uh, perspective on reinforcement learning and optimal control. Uh, and he has this kind of like table uh, of different like notations that people in the different communities use, and, and a bridge uh, for what uh, notation in one community uh, translates to in the other community. Uh, there's also a course at uh, at Princeton, the Foundations of uh, Reinforced Learning, uh, ECE 524. Uh, this is a lot of uh, kind of theory. If you're like really interested in understanding the the theoretical underpinnings of uh, reinforced learning, uh, then I would recommend uh, checking that out. All right, uh, the other topic, uh, or another topic we, we haven't really done any kind of justice to is human-robot interaction. Uh, ultimately, of course, we want our robots to inhabit uh, the real kind of human world, uh, and this makes human-robot interaction really, really uh, kind of relevant and, and extremely uh, important. Uh, I showed this video in the, the very first lecture. Uh, so this was one of uh, Google's uh, autonomous vehicles back in 2016, uh, trying to merge into a lane of a bus uh, that was driven by a human. And I think this was the, the first like documented uh, collision in the real uh, kind of uh, world deployment of a, between a, a, a human-driven uh, vehicle and an uh, autonomous uh, vehicle. Uh, there are lots and lots of different like topics in, in human-robot interaction. Um, so predicting human motion, uh, that's something where uh, uh, learning, machine learning, deep learning in particular, has had a, a lot of impact uh, over the last few years. So how is a, a car going to move? How is a pedestrian going to move? Uh, and then once you have those predictions, then you can use some of the uh, planning uh, techniques that we've discussed uh, in this course to avoid 
uh, like future places where like these other agents like cars or, or pedestrians will be. Uh, collaborative uh, manipulation, uh, so getting a robot on a human to pick up some large object, like a, a table, uh, for instance. Uh, communication via natural language, uh, imitation learning, yeah, there's, there's lots and lots of uh, fun uh, topics. Uh, and there's entire like, courses devoted to, to human-robot uh, interaction. Um, I guess I'm pointing to, to one here at uh, Georgia Tech uh, taught by uh, Andrea Tomas. They have a kind of nice uh, uh, source of uh, references so if you want to uh, dig deep into human-robot interaction. I think this is a, a decent place to, to start. Uh, and I guess the last one, I think, uh, technical topic that, that we didn't uh, really cover at all uh, is robot design, so hardware design, right? So I guess I chose to focus the course on theory and algorithms. Uh, we only have 24 lectures, there's a finite amount of time, so uh, we have to focus in on, on something. Uh, I guess here's one potential justification uh, for like this choice of not really covering uh, hardware design uh, that much. So this is a, a video from a few years ago now, I think maybe more than a decade ago, uh, of this really kind of impressive uh, demonstration, right? So we have this home robot. Um, I think this was a predecessor to the PR2, maybe this was the PR1 uh, cleaning up. This is sped up, of course, as, as you can see, but it's like cleaning up this, this room uh, pretty, pretty nicely. Like it, it picks up all the, the blocks uh, and it puts them in this bin. Uh, and this could be useful, right? Of course, the, the robot is like kind of really large and, and maybe not something you'd want in your house, but uh, you could imagine like replacing this with a a smaller like form factor robot, and this could potentially be, be pretty useful. Uh, I guess there's one caveat. Does someone know what or can guess what was going on in the video? This is uh, often, I guess, something that, uh, that robot videos uh, leave out. In this case, it was intentional, I guess, to, to make a point. But, um, yeah, so I guess this robot is not autonomous, or yeah, in, the, in the video, it was like, not autonomous. So this was teleoperated by a human. Uh, so the human is seeing uh, a video feed uh, from the perspective of the robot. Uh, and that's all they're seeing. And they have a, a joystick or some kind of like, interface that allows them to uh, control the, the robot. Uh, and I guess this is, you can think of this as an argument for why, uh, or you can think of this as an argument that what we're lacking is not necessarily hardware. Like we don't necessarily need some like, fancy robotic gripper to do what we saw in the video. Uh, what we're lacking is like algorithms uh, for detecting objects, picking them up, uh, manipulating them, avoiding obstacles, and, and all of that uh, kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, I guess this is, at least to me, evidence that, uh, that the, uh, a major bottleneck um, is uh, algorithms and theory, uh, and that hardware design, at least for these kinds of tasks, is, is not uh, necessarily the, the main bottleneck. Um, but like design of, import, uh, of robots is, is still really important. Like it could be the case that uh, you kind of co-design uh, the robot's hardware and the algorithms, uh, and it could be the case, and often is the case, that uh, this better hardware uh, makes the algorithms uh, easier, or, or makes the job of the algorithms uh, easier. And I think we've seen this quite a bit uh, in uh, the domain of uh, legged locomotion. So quadruped robots in particular over the last uh, five or, or more years, maybe like 10 years, let's say, uh, there's been a, a massive kind of leap uh, in terms of the maturity of the, the hardware. Uh, so nowadays, I guess you can buy really good uh, quadruped robots um, for like on the order of like $10,000 uh, or so, which is uh, like pretty good for uh, if you have a kind of academic uh, research budget. Uh, and there's lots of really amazing work on um, actuator design, sensor design, uh, mechanism design, battery technology. Uh, in many different uh, domains, uh, and specifically in like soft robotics, I guess that's an area that uh, uh, there's a, a massive amount of interest in. And if we really have good uh, soft robots, then potentially uh, that could make some of the uh, algorithms like more uh, robust because the, the hardware uh, itself is like partially responsible for uh, the robustness of the uh, the system. All right, so I guess that's just a, a, a few uh, topics. There's other topics that, that we haven't really done. Uh, much justice to, but yeah, let me just pause and, and see if there are any questions on this. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is, is zoom out a, a little bit uh, and talk about how robotics connects to uh, some broader kind of societal questions, so robotics and the economy, ethics, and, and laws. Uh, we've done this a little bit, so I guess at, at three points uh, in the, uh, the course, uh, we talked about some of the, the broader implications of the technical uh, material uh, that we've covered. I just want to 
I'll say a bit more about, uh, about that. Um, so if you read the, the kind of popular press, uh, there's uh, lots of coverage on, on uh, how potentially uh, automation uh, robotics uh, and automation more broadly in terms of AI uh, is going to have uh, a large, uh, maybe uh, really detri detrimental uh, impact uh, on our uh, economy and society. Uh, there's estimates, uh, there's kind of very large uh, error bars, I think, on, on these estimates, but estimates that yeah, robots could uh, take over 20 million jobs by, by 2030, um, and uh, other kind of uh, estimates on like probability of uh, particular uh, sectors of, uh, of jobs uh, being uh, impacted in some way uh, by robotics or automation more broadly. Uh, so I think it's, it's like pretty clear that robotics and, and automation is going to have a, a huge impact uh, on our economy and on employment. Um, there's particular sectors in, in, uh, specifically that, that seem uh, maybe more likely to be uh, impacted in the, the short term. Uh, so factory work, uh, I guess we've seen a, a lot of automation in, in the, the factory uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, warehouse uh, domains. Uh, truck driving, that's potentially another area where uh, autonomous vehicle companies are, are pouring a, a lot of investment uh, to do like long haul uh, trucking uh, autonomously. Um, and other jobs uh, might be indirectly impacted, even if they're not kind of directly uh, impacted. Uh, and yeah, possible, I guess, impacts of this are uh, increased unemployment, so that, that's a kind of direct one. Uh, increased inequality, since lower wage jobs are often more at risk uh, to automation uh, than other jobs. Uh, I guess here's the, the kind of uh, other side, like the, uh, the party line if you're a roboticist, uh, is that uh, the positive spin on this is that uh, dangerous jobs uh, maybe are the ones that are going to be uh, replaced, and so that's uh, maybe a good thing. Uh, and um, I think that the second bullet point is also like worth kind of seriously uh, considering and, and thinking about. Um, like it's often easier to think about existing jobs that are going to be kind of negatively impacted by automation. Uh, it's much harder to predict uh, new jobs that are going to be created. And I think we've often seen that uh, increased autonomy or increased like technology uh, also creates uh, other jobs. So just like maintaining the robots, programming the robots, and so on. Uh, and it's not clear how those balance out. Uh, I think, yeah, um, uh, there's, like I said, high error bars on, on like predictions for exactly how the economy will be aff uh, affected. Uh, I think there's no question that there's going to be some impact. This is like hard to say exactly what that uh, impact is going to be. Uh, and uh, I guess a number of uh, kind of uh, policy people, economists, are, are thinking about uh, different strategies for mitigating some of the negative uh, impacts of uh, automation. Uh, these are just uh, four uh, different strategies that I've listed over here. So retraining people uh, with uh, uh, potentially like at-risk uh, jobs. Uh, just rethinking education right from the beginning, so trying to, um, yeah, I guess steer uh, students towards directions that are maybe not as adversely impacted by, by automation. Uh, universal basic income, uh, there's, I guess, a couple of really prominent like politicians trying to uh, 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 advocate for, for uh, UBI, uh, so just everyone gets a basic income. and. Um, yeah, that can maybe uh, like mitigate some of the, the risks from uh, automation. Uh, robot tax, uh, that, that's another interesting one. I think Bill Gates is a, is a proponent of, of this one, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, some kind of tax on, uh, on uh, uh, automation and, uh, and robots. Uh, I guess any, any questions on, on this? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, I think, like, I guess the direct answer is, uh, like, majors that are represented, like, here, for instance, right? Like, that, that's, that's the sort of uh, uh, maybe, like, lazy, uh, like, answer. Uh, and I think, well, I guess that makes sense if we're thinking about education from an earlier stage. I think the much harder question is, like, for people whose jobs are going to be impacted, like, now, maybe, like, someone is in the middle of their career. Uh, and they don't have like the technical education in like computer science or mechanical engineering or electrical engineering. Like, how do you uh, retrain? Uh, like, yeah, how, how do you retrain them? And I think that that's a hard thing. And I guess part of that has to come from uh, like from like the government. I think to uh, like promote uh, that kind of retraining. 
Uh, and like partly it has to come from uh, like companies as well. So I think really large companies uh, can do this. Uh, so yeah, if there's like a portion of a company that's going to be impacted by automation, then the company can say, okay, like uh, these uh, employees who are going to be impacted by automation, uh, maybe we're going to have some kind of uh, training or retraining uh, program for them. Uh, and then they can kind of move to a, a slightly different role. I guess it's harder for smaller companies to, to invest uh, that kind of uh, money in, in uh, education or retraining. Yeah, I don't necessarily have a, a good answer. I don't, I don't know if you had the specific, uh, I guess, thoughts or uh, other people had specific thoughts on this. Yeah, it's, it's good to, to think about. Uh, a lot of these questions are things I'm going to mention I don't have good answers to. They're mostly meant to, I guess, make you think about, uh, about these questions. OK, so another yeah, set of questions that, that we don't have good answers to is uh, robotics and, and laws. Uh, so here's a, a thought experiment uh, to maybe just get us started thinking about this. So um, if an autonomous uh, vehicle, an autonomous car, uh, gets into an accident, uh, who should be held uh, responsible? So this is a question I think we're going to have to answer uh, one way or the other. Uh, here are a few reasonable uh, options. So maybe the, the passenger, so whoever happens to be riding in the car, uh, uh, pays the, the price or some uh, portion of the price. Uh, the owner of the car, uh, that's another uh, possibility. These are kind of just logical uh, possibilities. Uh, the manufacturer um, who uh, built the, the car. Uh, the car itself, not totally clear what it means, but it's actually kind of interesting maybe to, to think about that uh, possibility. Uh, or no one, which is not a, not a particularly uh, satisfying answer, but at least one logical uh, possibility. So I guess what do people think? So does someone want to argue for? Is, is it not like the programmer? <laughs> it's not a possibility. Uh, programmer, I was uh, kind of lumping that into a manufacturer. Um, but it's actually, I mean, it's not totally clear, right? So what does programmer mean? There's not like one programmer, right? Like one person. In terms of the team, the software team. Yeah. Uh, so it could be separate, right? So that, that could be um, like a kind of autonomy stack team. Uh, that could be the, the manufacturing of the, the hardware itself. Uh, that could be uh, manufacturing of the, the sensors uh, or like other components in the, in the car. And they're potentially different uh, uh, like entities, not necessarily the, the same entity. Uh, but I guess were, were you going to, or sorry, go ahead. You, you were going to. Yeah. 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 I think if you can trace it back, then then it makes sense. But it's, uh, I guess it, it can be tricky to to trace it back. Uh, and like you said, like if there's a sensor failure. Uh, maybe the car manufacturer just chose to use a bad sensor, right? And, and so it shouldn't be the sensor manufacturer who's maybe not trying to develop sensors for autonomous vehicles uh, directly. Maybe it's the manufacturer's fault for just using a bad sensor or not putting enough redundancy into the system with like multiple uh, sensors. I guess other thoughts or uh, maybe counter arguments. I guess does someone want to argue for any of the other options, so like the non-manufacturing options? Go ahead. I think it kind of also depends on how the accident happened and how severe it is. Like, if an autonomous car is driving and someone like hits in the back, of course, the person yep. in the back is at fault. So, um, but if it's like something like I don't know, if like um, the car was hacked by someone else, yeah. that might be a bit of maybe not manufacturer but programming because they should have had more security on the car to prevent that. Yeah. And like if maybe a severe accident happens and like the per people in the car like die or something, it's more of a manufacturer thing because when an accident occurs, they should be able to prevent. Like, Yep, yep, good, go ahead. The nature of the tool changes with scale. So I, in a small tool, I think of a knife. If someone stabs uh, someone else, is the knife manufacturer responsible of this crime? But in the greater scale example, I think of the atomic bomb in which are the scientists responsible for the creation of an atomic bomb that killed you know, millions of people. So in that 
that sense, will then the robots become, if, if they become huge and dangerous to like many numbers of people, then the uh, responsibility might go on to the manufacturer side in the spectrum. Mm. I think there needs to be a spectrum with the scale as one of the points. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I think I saw one more hand, maybe. Go ahead. Yeah. They don't tell them this car, then it's their fault. Yep. They should. They bought it. Yeah. They know there is. Yeah, that's a good point as well. Because I, I think it's unlikely that you can hold a manufacturer accountable for every like thousands of accidents that happen. Yeah. Right yeah, I think we're seeing, I guess, some of that play out with uh, the the lawsuits uh, involving like Tesla's uh, uh, semi-autonomous like vehicles, because that is a, a warning, right? That that you are like like the the human like driver is like ultimately responsible for. Uh, uh, for things that should be monitoring, but often that's not the case, and that's a question about like how good was the, the warning uh, to begin with. Uh, so yeah, I guess we'll we'll see some resolution maybe to to some of these questions in the next. War between morality and legality. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good points. Um, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. That one is harder to enforce, maybe, right? Uh, um, but yeah, I think that that's a that's a good point as well. Uh, I guess. Sorry, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. I, I almost have an argument for no one. Okay. Because if you have like a car with a human driver, and like say this AI car, like if you look at a lot of data, you can see that they actually prevent a lot of accidents. But some of them still, for some reason, inevitably happen. Yeah. But there's almost like a like such a net positive effect that like. Who can you blame? It's done a lot more good than some harm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I think, I think that's a good point. And, and I guess this uh, brings up the question of like when uh, we should adopt like this technology like at scale. Uh, and I think the bar for like autonomous vehicles is probably going to be higher for, uh, for humans. So I think currently uh, there are 30 something thousand uh, fatalities roughly in the US per year from, from uh, car accidents. Uh, and probably the, the number of uh, like fatal accidents or like severe accidents uh, needs, is going to need to be significantly lower than 30,000 in, in the US uh, like for society to, be, to accept uh, um, uh, like this technology. Uh, but then if we get to that point, uh, then yeah, maybe there's a, a case for uh, no one uh, to be held responsible, especially in cases where there's no clear like component like failure or like no clear uh, like party that was uh, responsible. Like it's just the, the data that was used to train the system somehow was not sufficient uh, to prevent an accident and it's like hard to, uh, yeah, it's hard to blame any uh, specific person. Uh, so I was actually, I was presenting uh, this uh, to the Princeton uh, Ethics uh, Society uh, and someone uh, argued for the car itself, which I thought was, uh, was pretty interesting. And I guess the, the argument was, uh, that it gives us some like catharsis, basically, like some kind of uh, satisfaction uh, to like punish uh, uh, like some agent, uh, and that agent could be the, the car, and so maybe we have some kind of like trial where we hold the, the car responsible and, and some kind of uh, like punishment for the, the car, and maybe that gives us uh, as humans uh, more closure. I thought that was an interesting argument for uh, for for car itself. Okay. So I guess current laws are, are uh, written mostly for like human drivers, and, and there's kind of a, a shift happening towards uh, increasing uh, regulation and le legislation for uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, and uh, so uh, there's a kind of article uh, from 2016, which I think is still uh, uh, quite relevant today, uh, describing the, the legal landscape around uh, autonomous vehicles. There's been more activity, uh, but not kind of a resolution uh, in a, on a lot of these uh, questions that we discussed. Uh, I guess the NHTSA, the National Highway uh, Transportation uh, something Safety Administration, uh, clarified that the occupant uh, is not going to be responsible uh, under current laws, which I think makes uh, makes some sense. If you're just yeah, if you just happen to be sitting in a uh, autonomous vehicle, then the current laws uh, are not going to hold you uh, responsible, unless you fall into I guess one of the other uh, categories. Uh, and yeah, currently the, the manufacturer uh, will, is probably going to bear, bear uh, a large uh, liability. Um, but I guess as we discussed, like how could the manufacturer possibly predict every traffic scenario? And maybe there's going to be some 
small uh, proportion of, uh, of uh, crashes uh, that we're going to have to uh, be satisfied with, uh, especially if it significantly reduces the, the number of uh, fatalities uh, as compared to uh, the, the scenario now. Uh, and yeah, I guess maybe the, the federal government, so this connects to what you were saying, maybe the, the federal government needs to take some of the, the financial burden of the manufacturers uh, uh, to help us uh, adopt this uh, technology. Uh, and current laws are, are going to need to be updated, um, and it's not entirely uh, clear how. Uh, and I guess the, just more broadly, the, it's not just about autonomous vehicles, but we're seeing increasing adoption uh, of robotics technology in, in many other domains. Uh, and this rise of uh, uh, adoption r raises serious questions about uh, legal liability, uh, safety regulations and certifications. So even before an accident happens, like what are uh, some uh, tests or, or things uh, that uh, an autonomous vehicle company or an autonomous drone company uh, needs to do uh, to be able to deploy their robots out in the, the real world? Uh, and yeah, these are questions to, uh, important questions to, to think about. Uh, there's a case, an uh, interesting case for a uh, federal robotics commission. So there's a federal aviation administration, which is responsible for regulations uh, around, um, I guess, flying uh, like vehicles, uh, airplanes, drones, and, and so on. Um, so you could kind of maybe broaden that uh, and think about uh, a federal uh, robotics communication uh, commis commission uh, that's responsible for uh, like setting regulations around uh, autonomous systems in general. I guess the argument here is that autonomous uh, systems across different application domains share a lot of the, the same like underlying technical challenges and maybe thinking about some of these uh, legal frameworks and regulations in a unified way uh, might be the way to go as opposed to thinking about them uh, kind of piecemeal separately for each application domain. Uh, there's a different argument, a counter argument. Uh, so this is a, a paper uh, from 2018, so the future of legal uh, and ethical regulations for autonomous robotics that kind of argues the, the opposite. Um, uh, and the argument here is that uh, we shouldn't necessarily be thinking about uh, autonomous systems uh, just as one bucket. Uh, like often, like different application domains have different challenges uh, and different like requirements, and we should think about uh, the different like domains, like drones separately, uh, like factory robots uh, separately, uh, and so on. Uh, and I guess the, the other piece of the argument is that autonomous systems are usually based on, often based on like older technologies. Uh, for which there are like pretty mature um, and well-established uh, regulations and, and legal frameworks, and maybe we can start with them uh, as, a, as a good starting point and then uh, adapt them rather than kind of like wholesale, like rethinking uh, uh, legislative uh, frameworks. And yeah, I guess there's good arguments, I think, uh, on both sides. Like maybe there's something in the middle where um, there's, there's some uh, kind of broadly applicable set of legal frameworks, uh, like broadly applicable to autonomous systems, and then uh, some more kind of specific uh, things uh, across uh, like specific different uh, application domains. Uh, I guess the, the last uh, thing I want to talk about, uh, the last like, broad topic, is robotics and, and ethics. And I think when we think about robotics and ethics, there's two different kinds of questions one could ask. Uh, so one is ethically deploying robots, so military robots, for instance, uh, and the other is ethical robots. So how do you get robots to, to be ethical? Uh, I guess I'm mostly going to talk about the, the second uh, question. So how do we uh, build some notion of, of uh, ethics uh, into robots? Um, so the starting point usually for, for this discussion is the, the trolley problem. So maybe you've seen this problem before. Uh, if you haven't, uh, there's a nice video. I'll let it play, and uh, it does a good job of explaining uh, what this uh, problem is. Welcome to The Moral Machine a platform for gathering a human perspective on moral decisions made by machine intelligence, such as self-driving cars. We show you moral dilemmas, where a driver Oh, wait, sorry, I think I skipped a... Never mind, sorry, I skipped a slide. There we go. A runaway train is heading towards five workers on a railway line. There's no way of warning, but you're standing near a lever that operates some points. Switch the points and the train goes down a spur. Trouble is, there's another worker on that bit of track too, but it's one fatality instead of five. Should you do that? Many people think the right thing to do would be to switch the points, to sacrifice one to save five, since that produces the best outcome possible. Now imagine the train heading for the workers again. This time it can only be stopped by pushing a very large man off a bridge. His great bulk would stop the train. 
but he'd die. Should you do that? Most people say no. But why not? Both thought experiments are cases of sacrificing one to save five. What the trolley problem examines is whether moral decisions are simply about outcomes or about the manner in which you achieve them. Some utilitarians argue that the two cases are not importantly different from each other. Both have similar consequences, and consequences are all that really matter. In each case, one person dies and five are saved. The best option in each harrowing situation. But lots of people say they would switch the points, but they wouldn't push the man off the bridge. Are they simply inconsistent, or are they on to something? All right, so the connection, I guess, to robotics is uh, explained a bit the in the second machine, video. A platform for gathering a human perspective on moral decisions made by machine intelligence, such as self-driving cars. We show you moral dilemmas, where a driverless car must choose the lesser of two evils, such as killing two passengers or five pedestrians. As an outside observer, you judge which outcome you think is more acceptable. You can then see how your responses compare with other people. If you're feeling creative, you can also design your own scenarios for you and others to view, share and discuss. Moral Machine is a project by the Scalable Cooperation Group at the MIT Media Lab. Help us learn how to make machines moral. Because the music is like somewhat incongruous uh, to the, the seriousness of that topic. Uh, go ahead. I would say, isn't there like a third question from like the slide that you had? Were this about like the creation of the robot itself being ethical? Like, for instance, like what training data you might use in like a, um, I guess like a, I forgot what it was called, like the AI that just learns from the behavior of other people. Oh, like, a, like imitation learning, for instance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's a that, that's a good point. I guess I was lumping that into ethical robots, uh, but you can think of it separately. Like, how do we, um, I guess, make the the robots uh, like ethical yeah, in the sense of uh, embodying like some of the the values that that we care about? I guess maybe there's a separate question, which is, do you uh, develop the robot at all, uh, or like are there some kinds of like technologies that that you don't uh, try to to develop? Uh, is that where you were going, or, or were you thinking? Oh, I see. Are okay. You allowed to use that to make a robot that will go and do good things? Oh, interesting. Okay. That's a good point. I hadn't, yeah, I guess I hadn't thought about that. Uh, do you have, yeah, I'm trying to think of examples where that kind of data collection might be beneficial. I guess, do you have a thought? Uh, the history of medical uh, sciences could be a Yeah, good point. Good. Yeah. I guess what do people think? In, in that uh, kind of scenario. I think that one, maybe there's more, we could probably rely on some of the, the existing um, like regulations around like medical, like development of medical devices. Uh, yeah, especially in the, the US, I guess there's, there's been kind of evolving uh, like scrutiny and, and uh, like thought given to, uh, to that question. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And I think that this relates to sort of the the trolley problem question as well, right? Uh, so I guess what do people think about the the trolley problem? Like, is it uh, worth thinking about, or uh, yeah, I guess uh, uh, criticisms of the trolley problem? Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Okay, I see. Yeah, I guess that, that makes it even even more uh, challenging and uh, yeah, I guess forces us to, to think about uh, yeah, questions about like equality. That's a good good thought. Go ahead. Yeah. Just yeah. True. Yeah. So it's more about like this: how we feel, right? Like as uh, as humans. Uh, 
And yeah, I guess the question is like, should, like if you're programming robots, uh, should we bake in the bias or uh, yeah, bias that we have uh, uh, in in terms of like answering this uh, this trolley problem, or should we uh, like bake in some kind of like purely like utilitarian uh, like reasoning process and not yeah not not uh, bake in the, the human biases? Um, go ahead. I, I guess I would I would argue that it does matter because uh, like if we're like inhabiting I guess the, the same like space as, as these uh, like autonomous systems or if we're like using them uh, there's a question about like trust uh, and I think yeah if if uh, uh, I guess these systems are uh, like embodying uh, like some of the, the basic values uh, or, or like if we know that they they have like baked in uh, these like basic values that we care about then we're more likely to, to trust them and use them. And just be kind of happier with them. Uh, I saw another hand. Go ahead. Yeah, I've seen how you said you're building in values and building in human morals. But I think it's kind of interesting because you get into the question of um, absolute right and wrong or relative right and wrong. Yeah. Culture. So you, if you program a car like that in the US and you put some morals into it, they might be very yeah. Like they might be very different than other countries other other yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I think I don't remember whether it was this project or or uh, maybe some follow-on work or different work, but they looked at this question of how uh, different uh, like people in different cultures like answer this question and how uh, so age, for instance. Uh, so I guess in uh, some uh, like Asian like countries, there's more. This is like from the the studies. I'm not uh, I guess trying to make this up, but uh, Asian countries there's more of a a sort of respect for age, and, and in, in some Western cultures, it's, it's flipped, and, and like some of that was like seen in the, the data that was collected. I don't have the, the exact study uh, here, but I think it was related to, to this. Go ahead. And this is interesting because with like the moral machine, are they trying to use this to just get like a majority rules? <laughs> and like that would be kind of interesting. Yeah. Or like Yeah, I think it's more the latter. So I guess if we take it like very seriously uh, and like bake in exactly these values, uh, that seems questionable. I think it's more to just force us to think about what the values should be uh, and and try to come to some kind of like consensus if we can. Um, there's also like this kind of criticism of the the trolley problem specifically. I think it's a good like starting point, but. Uh, um, so this article uh, in, in Fast Companies, uh, the title is like, Why the Trolley Dilemma is a Terrible Model for Trying to Make Self-Driving Cars uh, Safer. Uh, and I guess the, the main criticism is that it's too simplistic, right? So we're assuming that the autonomous vehicle or that the person in the, the trolley problem uh, has a forced like binary choice. Like you have to select one or the other. Uh, and most situations where, uh, yeah, robot uh, I guess it's like pretty rare for a, for a robot to encounter a situation where it's a forced like binary choice. Uh, go ahead. What if you didn't give it any morals at all? No, okay. Same problem. You know, you're driving self-driving car. Yeah. Approaching two different groups of people. Yeah. If you gave it nothing, yeah. what would it do? So if you gave it nothing, and, and I think that that's that's a pretty reasonable point. I guess you could say like just like don't even worry about like these these kinds of questions. <laughs> Just yeah, just drive and like just don't collide with anything, right? Uh, just don't collide with uh, with like humans at all. Uh, and I think that 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 is like part of the the argument here is that like some of these kind of trolley problem questions are not necessarily like directly relevant to the engineering problem of like how should I make my autonomous vehicle safe. Um, but I think I it, it like I think it's good to think about these questions and uh, I guess maybe the more like direct. Uh, like manifestation of these questions that we're seeing like now, uh, like have to do with uh, like fairness, right? Uh, so that we talked about, uh, I guess a, a couple of lectures ago. So people have found uh, that image recognition uh, tools or or just uh, uh, kind of models that are based on machine learning 
unbiased data can uh, like embody some of the other biases that, that we have uh, uh, against like different uh, demographic groups. Uh, and I think there, uh, these questions I would argue are, are like pretty directly relevant. Like we should think about what we mean by fairness. Uh, and like we have to somehow like mathematically quantify it to, to even assess like whether uh, like these uh, machine learning kind of uh, models are uh, like fair or, or not, and of course ultimately to, to train uh, systems that uh, that are like fair by our definitions. Um, go, uh, go ahead. So it, it's related to fairness, but I almost in my mind feel like the self-driving car is actually a harder or an easier problem than the fairness. Yeah. Fairness, there are a lot of flaws in society. It's hard to like counteract them and whatnot. But yeah. Yeah. Like, if just nobody ever jaywalked ever and nobody ever <laughs> stood on train tracks, then what decision is the car making? It's just going on the path, like, unrestricted. The question is then when, you know, like if the car knows to stop at a red light and that's the only time this, you know, people are walking, yeah. then I feel like that's a lot, like that's very easily avoidable. Yeah. If you, if you change human behaviors, if the car never even has to make those decisions. Yeah, yeah I agree with you. I think with some of the, the really, like, safety critical, um, like, applications of robotics, the ethical questions are a bit clearer in a sense because you're just trying to, to like avoid uh, like collisions or avoid unsafe uh, scenarios. Um, but yeah, I guess with, with some of the, the emerging applications of, uh, of learning in particular, uh, the questions are a bit more, more or the answers maybe are, are a bit more murky on the questions. Yeah. Changing skin color. Yeah. More fluid. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the. I guess the maybe the, the high level point is uh, that we should be thinking about these these things, right? Uh, these biases and how, uh, like, our engineering systems like reflect these these biases. And I mean, maybe surprisingly, I guess this was not something that. Uh, was part of the mainstream conversation uh, even yeah until about uh, like five or six years or so ago where there was like a resurgence of or not resurgence I guess uh, an increase in, in interest in, in uh, like thinking about these questions and um, yeah like different like biases of, uh, of machine learning models so I guess maybe that that's ultimately the uh, the main kind of message I, I want to convey but you're right like I guess these things are going to evolve uh, but trying to quantify what we mean by fairness or trying to be just more precise about uh, what we mean by values and, and uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, like just baking those in or figuring out ways to, to bake those into our robotic systems is uh, something we should all be thinking about. Other, I guess, thoughts or, or questions? All right. Okay, so the last uh, thing I want to talk about is, is some uh, grand challenges, at least from, from my perspective in, in uh, robotics. Uh, so, in my opinion, I think there's two uh, kind of uh, areas, like two uh, classes of, of problems uh, that, that I find particularly exciting and, and uh, challenging. Uh, so the first one uh, relates kind of directly to all the things that we've talked about in this course, so trying to ensure safety, robustness, and generalization uh, of our uh, robotic systems. Uh, the other one, which uh, I guess we've talked about a little bit, but I want to spend uh, maybe just a couple more minutes talking about. Uh, is thinking about like some of the theoretical foundations of uh, of robotics. Uh, so the first one um, uh, kind of relates to this this theme of uh, uncertainty uh, that we've seen over and over uh, again in this course. Um, so I mentioned just back in kind of lecture one that uh, uncertainty was going to be of fundamental importance when we think about robotics, and we've seen this uh, in uh, all the different like topics that we've covered in this course. So uncertainty in the dynamics of your system, uncertainty in the initial state, state estimation, environment geometry, and I guess hopefully you have a more kind of visceral maybe appreciation for uh, these different sources of uncertainty having worked on hardware uh, where you see a lot of the, the challenges really kind of manifest themselves uh, and be uh, pretty painful. Um, so uh, I think one kind of important uh, question is how do we try to make some formal mathematical like, guarantees on, on safety and performance for our uh, robotic systems? Uh, and there's lots of like technical challenges that we need to somehow address uh, if we want to uh, like formally guarantee uh, safety or performance uh, of our robots. 
so thinking about these challenges of nonlinear and uncertain dynamics, uh, high dimensional sensing, uh, like particularly when you have like vision or lidar, uh, and you're like trying to process that in real time. Um, how do we do that while uh, maintaining uh, some kind of uh, safety guarantees? Uh, how do we incorporate uh, learning? Like how do we incorporate deep learning in particular? So if you have a neural network as part of your perception or control loop that you've trained on some amount of data, like how do you make sure uh, that that trained system is going to perform well when you deploy it in scenarios that you've not kind of explicitly uh, trained it to, to do well on? And I think it's kind of maybe useful to, to think about some of these questions uh, in the context of your final project. Uh, so how would you kind of guarantee, let's say even probabilistically, uh, that your robot is going to successfully navigate uh, through some previously uh, unknown, uh, unseen uh, obstacle uh, configuration? Uh, and it, yeah, it's pretty challenging to, to try to, to make these kinds of uh, guarantees. Uh, but it like forces you to think about some of the assumptions uh, that you've made in designing the algorithms and I think that by itself can be a useful uh, exercise uh, to, to try to go through. Uh, and of course, if we're deploying safety critical systems, we want to have some uh, assurances, some like formal assurances uh, that the systems that we deploy are going to be safe under some uh, assumptions. Uh, so this is the, the kind of thing I guess we work on in, in our uh, research group. So we uh, think about uh, enabling uh, agile robotic systems to operate with guaranteed safety and performance in uh, complex environments. Uh, and we have a number of different uh, kind of hardware uh, platforms that we have uh, either we use in our uh, lab. Uh, so the top left is a, a drone uh, that's flying in our uh, forestal uh, lab space. Uh, the bottom left is a robotic uh, manipulator that we have in the knee quad. Uh, the bottom right is actually a collaboration with the Jaime Fisax group where we were uh, using a, a quadruped uh, kind of navigating around these different uh, indoor environments. I guess if you're interested in, in learning more, uh, I've linked uh, to our uh, lab website um, and the descriptions of our research and, and recent uh, papers and, and so on. You should talk to the AIs as well uh, to learn more about uh, what we're doing. Um, uh, the other, uh, uh, I guess, uh, point I wanted to make uh, is that uh, there's a lot of really kind of uh, basic theoretical questions uh, that we don't have good answers to in, in robotics. So I've listed uh, a few examples of these. So how much memory does your robot need uh, in order to perform a certain task. Maybe it's like navigating for a long time horizon in a large environment. Uh, how much information do you need from your sensors? Uh, what kind of specific sensors do you need uh, to get to a certain level of performance? How much computation do you need? And, and so on. Um, other questions like when is one task uh, harder for a particular robot than another task? Uh, how do we even define like what does harder uh, even mean? Uh, when is one robot better for a given task uh, than another? Uh, I guess these are like pretty basic questions you could imagine maybe like middle school or high school students like asking some of these questions and I think we have almost like no clue of trying to uh, like thinking about how to formalize these questions uh, mathematically and, and uh, I guess let alone like trying to, uh, to answer them. Um, so robotics borrows a lot of ideas and technical tools from many other uh, related areas like feedback control, optimization, machine learning and so on. Um, but I think ultimately, hopefully, maybe we're going to have our own uh, theoretical foundations. And I think it's useful to compare the state of robotics with uh, the state of a slightly more uh, mature area uh, like computer science. Uh, so many of these questions have uh, analogs, uh, like analogous versions in computational complexity theory, for instance, I guess, uh, for those of you who are in, uh, in computer science. So uh, hardness uh, has a has a very specific uh, mathematical meaning. Uh, better uh, has a uh, mathematical meaning. Uh, efficiency has uh, kind of concrete uh, mathematical definitions. And uh, I guess taking inspiration from that and, and like porting some of those ideas to robotics, uh, I think could be an enabler for uh, long-term progress in, in robotics. All right, I guess any, any questions on, uh, on those thoughts? All right, so yeah, just, just to end, a uh, couple, uh, couple of things. So there's a uh, new course, or I guess new newish course, um, so ECE uh, slash MA346. Uh, so this is meant to be a, a sequence. Uh, so this course and, and uh, Jaime Physics course in uh, ECE, uh, so it's titled Intelligent uh, Robotic Systems. Um, so it's, uh, I guess, more advanced treatment uh, of some of the, the topics that we've seen in this course. Uh, and also some other uh, topics that we haven't seen in this course. Uh, so he covers uh, topics like planning under uncertainty, active perception, 
uh, learning based control, uh, multi agent uh, decision making, uh, yeah, which we haven't really covered uh, much, and some human robot uh, interaction, I believe, as well. Uh, and the hardware assignments are on these uh, mobile robots, so with, uh, I think, uh, like autonomous trucks uh, that move around, uh, and they use ROS, so that's the robot uh, operating system uh, that's pretty useful to, to learn about, which, again, we haven't uh, covered in, in this course. Um, yeah, and I guess I would strongly encourage you to at least consider this course and, and take this course uh, if you're interested in, in pursuing uh, robotics further. Uh, I think this is going to be the, the second time it's, uh, it's offered, uh, so yeah, it should be a, a fun uh, course to, to take. Um, so yeah, I guess last slide, uh, things I, I hope I've convinced you uh, throughout this, this course. Uh, so the first thing is that there's just tremendous amount of excitement around robotics, uh, massive investment from industry, government, uh, universities, uh, and we've seen examples of that in, in different domains, uh, so drones, robotic manipulation, uh, and many other uh, application domains as well. Uh, I guess hopefully I've convinced you that there's a lot of uh, really fascinating technical challenges. We've seen some of that uh, in this course uh, in our uh, various uh, labs that, that we've done. Uh, so thinking about feedback control, motion planning, uh, localization mapping, uh, machine learning, and there's lots of beautiful connections with, with all of these uh, different areas, uh, some of which we've, we've seen uh, in this course and, and many, uh, I guess, which you'll see if you continue to uh, to pursue uh, robotics. Uh, there's lots of important legal, economic, and ethical considerations, uh, which I, I feel like we haven't really done justice to. It's hard to do justice to, uh, but it's important to, uh, to think about these, these questions. Uh, and I guess the, the most important thing from my perspective, uh, so if I, I feel like if I've convinced you that robotics is really, uh, really cool and exciting, then I think I've uh, done my job. Uh, and yeah, if even a fraction of you pursue robotics, uh, then I think that's a, a win. Uh, I guess any last uh, thoughts or, or questions? All right, I think that's all I had. So I guess good luck with the final exam period, and I will see all of you on uh, demo day.